Today we're going to talk about what a day was like for the ancient Egyptians. We're going to look at each different kind of job or level in society and just look at what everyday life was like. So when you pull up the assignment, you can see that first you're going to read the day in the life pages or you can be watching me read it. And then as you read it, you're going to fill out this worksheet down here. So I'm going to go ahead and click on the worksheet and walk you through what you'll be doing. As always, you know, you'll want to click edit presentation and edit in browser. I went ahead and put the text boxes in for you, but if ever there's a worksheet that does not have text boxes and you need to type, you'll just want to make sure you click insert text box and then put it in that way. I always click view, zoom 100%. And then that way I can see a little bit better. So you can see here, it's going to be a day in the life of a pharaoh. That's going to be the first one we read about. So you're going to answer some questions here. You know, who makes sure the pharaoh is always safe and perfectly presented each day? Why must the pharaoh go to the temple every day and pay tribute to the chief god Amun-Ra? So why is he going to the temple and paying tribute or honor to the god? How do people know what the pharaoh looked like? How were they able to see him? And what is the Pharaoh's final duty for the day? So that's what you're listing for, for the day in the life of the Pharaoh. So then with the craftsman, you know, tell me, you know, what sounds and smells does the craftsman encounter on his way to work in the morning? How does the craftsman get to work? Based on what you read, do you think he's upper class or middle class? And then the big part is you have to tell me, how do you know? Then we go on to the priest, a day in the life of a priest. Why do you think the priests place food in front of the image of the God? You know, number two, you're looking, you know, what do you think the priest, priest's main jobs were? What was their job? What, what were they supposed to be doing? And number three, where would you place a priest on the social pyramid? Meaning, you know, were they upper, upper class or were they middle class? Why do you think that? And then you'll have to click here for page two. And we're looking at a day in the life of a farmer. Number one asks, you know, what is the main part of a farmer and his family's diet? You know, what is he going to eat? What's the main thing he eats? Number two, since they didn't have any money as we do today, how did the farmer pay taxes? You know, what did he pay his, what did he use to pay the taxes? What did he give to the government? Number three, which social class would a farmer be considered part of? You know, was he upper class, middle class, lower class? And then would they be considered wealthy or poor? And then finally, the last one, a day in the life of a woman. <clears throat> You're going to listen for, you know, what seems to be the primary responsibilities of a woman who is a wife and a mother. So what was the, the wife, the woman supposed to do? What did she do every day? You know, why do you suppose she enjoys something such as laundry day? Why did she enjoy laundry day? And where do women fit on the Egyptian social pyramid? You know, do were they, meaning, you know, were they held with much respect or kind of, you know, ignored? And why do you think that? So filling this out as you go along, and then we're going to take a look at the reading pages. So you'll want to click on yours. You can either read it, follow along, listen here. So we're starting with a day in the life of a pharaoh. The sun rises on yet another bright day in ancient Egypt. A man wakes up. This isn't any uh, ordinary man. This is the Pharaoh. This is the last time he will be alone for hours. He has many officials, servants, and slaves to make sure he is always safe and perfectly presented. His day begins with cleaning and dressing by servants, including the splendidly named chief of the scented oils and paste for rubbing his majesty's body. When he is clean, he is dressed and adorned with huge amount of jewelry. After all, he is Pharaoh. He owns vast amounts of gold, and he needs to look the part. The Pharaoh then walks to the audience chamber to hold his daily meetings. As guests enter the room, they prostrate themselves in front of him, meaning they stand up straight and proper. He is a divine majesty. They are mere mortals. As usual, there are ambassadors who are offering tributes from foreign countries, Generals taking, talking about military matters, the usual nobility, 
and some special envoys from across the empire. So people visiting them from across the empire. The day's audiences are completed. He leaves for the temple. As Pharaoh, he must pay tribute to the chief god Amun-Ra. It's a pain, but if he doesn't do it, the empire can lose its divine order or mot. It could descend into chaos and he would be held responsible. It's not worth the risk. Remember that they, they believed that if the gods weren't happy, then the gods would do terrible things to them. Accompanied by the high priest, the pharaoh walks through the great temple to the sanctuary, enjoying the cool air and smelling the thick incense. Inside, he approaches the statue of Amun-Ra. He asks the gods some questions, receives answers from the high priest. The questions over, he is presented with a large bowl. After the prayers, the sacred butcher cuts the bull's throat as a sacrifice to the gods. And that's all just the morning, so now we're at the afternoon. There's nothing like a slaughter to work up a big appetite, so the pharaoh returns to his palace for some lunch. Afterwards, he jumps into his royal chariot for a tour of the city. This is long before photos. Few, few people know what he looks like, so crowds of Egyptians gather in the streets to catch sight of their divine ruler. Surrounded by bodyguards, he visits some construction sites where magnificent new buildings are being constructed in his honor. Back at the palace, he gets a welcome break. After a day surrounded by people, he can finally be alone and wander through his beautiful gardens. Now it's evening. His final daily duty comes in the late afternoon. He returns to the temple for a ceremony that marks the setting of the sun and the end of the day. After that, he goes back home for an early night. After all, even divine majesties need their beauty sleep. So if you want, you can pause this video, um, go over to your sheet, fill in the three qu the questions about the pharaoh, and then come back and watch more of the video for the next section, because now we're moving on to a day in the life of a priest. So now we're talking about the priest. It's still dark when Itenu, that's the name of the priest, gets up. He's a middle-ranking priest at the great temple to Amun-Ra. He has to be ready by dawn when the assistant high priest gives him instructions for the day. As the sun first appears, every priest chants the dawn hymn, Awake in peace, great God. The most senior priest unseals, opens the sanctuary, and says a ritual prayer four times over the image of the God. This gives the God his soul so that he can take physical earthly shape again. Then the image, the statue, is carefully cleaned and rubbed with oil. Incense is burned as its old clothes are removed and the image is redressed in white, red, blue, and green linen. So they're dressing the statues. The dressing is completed with perfume, makeup, and jewels on the statue. Now that the god is dressed, it's time for the god's breakfast. So this is a meal of bread, roast meat, fruits, and vegetables. Beer and wine are also laid out for the statue. Once the priests think that the god has eaten all he can handle, the food is removed. It goes back to the kitchens where Atenu, the priest, distributes, distributes it to the temple staff as part of their wages. Water is now sprinkled over the sanctuary and the image. The priests wave around more incense and put natron, which is cleansing salt, and resin on the floor. Then they leave, sealing the sanctuary ahead of the pharaoh's daily visit. Now Atenu and the other priests practice their chanting while they wait for the pharaoh. Once the visit is in progress, Atenu takes the bowl and leads it into the sanctuary. Here it will be presented to the pharaoh before being ritual ritually slaughtered as a sacrifice to the god. Now it's afternoon. Once the pharaoh has gone, Atenu and his fellow priests sit down to a lunch of pea and lentil soup, accompanied by fresh bread. It's time for an afternoon nap. Chanting is surprisingly tiring work. Nap over, it's back to work. He has to officiate at a funeral of a very important person. Because the man was an important courtier, he may be buried in the highly prestigious Valley of the Kings. Etenu, the priest, boards the funeral barge or boat carrying the coffin. It sails across the Nile is placed on a sled and is then pulled by two oxen uh, to its new home. 
Attend you supervises the funeral arrangements. He then accompanies the coffin to the tomb where he says his final prayers. The coffin is then sealed by the masons. Evening. Back at the temple, Etenu crosses the river again. This time he is going to the city of the dead. This is the home of the Egyptian funeral industry. A member of the royal family has died and custom dictates, dictates says that a priest must oversee the mummification of the body. By sunset, it is time to go back to the temple and straight to bed. Tomorrow will be another long day. So again, now you're going to want to go back to that worksheet and fill in the questions about the day of the life of the priest. You can pause this video and then fill that out as you are listening or go back and fill it out. Come back to the video. Now we're moving on to a day in the life of a craftsman. It's early in the morning and the sun is rising over the Thebes. One is rising over Thebes, one of the great cities of the ancient world. Nebtalwa, the name of the craftsman, is still asleep. He lives in a simple house set among tradesmen, craftsmen, metal workers, scribes, and stonemasons. Nebtalwa is a master craftsman, so he gets a little extra time in the morning because he doesn't have to show up at work until all the others have arrived. Finally, he gets up gets dressed and joins his family for breakfast. As usual, they sit on the ground and eat with their fingers. Their breakfast is typical, figs, dates and bread, butter and honey, all washed down with fresh milk. The kids go off to school, but then it's time for Nebtawa to go to work. He opens the door to the sounds and the smells of nearby butchers, bakers, and shopkeepers getting ready for the day. So in the question, I want you to think about what kind of sounds and smells that would be, you know, at a butcher. What kind of sounds and smells would be at a baker's? What sounds and smells would be at a shopkeeper's? Like most Egyptians, Nebtawa walks to work, a building site where he is supervising the construction of a new temple. The building is complete now, so the site is swarming with artists who are decorating the fresh plaster on the walls. It's another hot day, and by mid-morning, Nebtawa needs a break. He finds some shade and drinks some cool wine from a pitcher. But soon he's back on site, checking on the work and stopping occasionally to give advice or correct some mistakes. Now it's afternoon. Lunchtime has always been important for site workers, and Thebes is no different. Nebtawa joins some other workers for bread and fish caught earlier that day from the Nile. Then it's off to a meeting with other master craftsmen who are working on a number of different projects throughout the city. Before he knows it, work is over. Nebtawa packs up and walks home. When he gets back, he finds his two sons doing their math homework on small pieces of papyrus. Now it's evening. It's time for dinner and the family sits down to a good meal of roasted meats, lentils, and carrots. By the time they're finished, it's getting dark, so Nebtawa lights a small oil lamp and sits back with a cup of beer. Back in that time, they did not have the same clean, safe drinking water we did, so they had to have, you know, different beer and wine because the properties of it was antibacterial, antiviral. It was not the same type of beer or wine that we have now. It was a lot of times very watered down to give them something to drink, but yet it would be safe for them to drink. His kids persuade him to play Senate, which was a popular board game. Each player has six wooden cones and must get them to the other side of the board and then back again. They throw four wooden sticks to determine how far each piece can move at any one time. His sons are getting better at this game and Nebtawa is lucky to win. By the time they finish, it's time to put his boys to bed. Then he and his wife blow out the lamp and hit the sack. It's time for sleep. So now again, go back to your worksheet on the day in the life and fill in your questions for the craftsman. And now we're looking at a day in the life of a, sol of a soldier. Standing very still, Midjaa watches the sun rise, but the only thing on his, uh, on his mind is how his new sandals make his feet hurt and how much longer he can hold his spear steady. As a soldier, one of the pharaoh's elite bodyguards he has already been up for hours. 
In another hour, he's relieved for breakfast, which means he gets to be done guarding and gets to go to breakfast. It's the same every day. A piece of bread, no peanut butter or jelly for Mida, just bread. He's, if he's lucky, it won't be too stale. The officers always get the best rations, the best por parts of the food. After breakfast, he does drill practice on a plane outside Thebes. After his unit has been yelled at by their superiors, they go on maneuvers, practicing charges and battle divisions, battle formations with the rest of the rest of his division, a total of 5,000 men. The entire division is on the plane in battle formation of centers and wings. Everyone is involved. He and the other elite archers, the spearmen, and the chariots. It's tiring, but fun. The excitement of battle, but none of the danger. After a bad start of the day, he finally feels like a soldier again. Now afternoon. After the maneuvers, the soldiers stop for lunch. Today, the rations are lentils, which is a type of bean, and garlic, with some Syrian bread. Popular in the army since they discovered it on service there years ago. As Egypt is currently at peace, there is little fighting to do. So after lunch, his company of 200 men is deployed to work on a government project. Today, they are digging irrig irrigation canal on farmland belonging to one of the big temples. It's hot work and he can feel the sweat trickling down his back. Still, it could be worse. His friends in another com company have been told to carry stones up a mountain for the Pharaoh's tomb. Now it's evening. After a short break in the late afternoon, the company marches back to the, its barracks to clean their kit and get some supper. The sun is now beginning to go down, but the day is far from over. Instead, it's ending as it began, on sentry duty at the palace guarding the pharaoh. So now answer the questions there about a day in the life of a soldier. And then finally, or not finally, but the next one we have is a day in the life of a farmer. So life for a farmer is governed by the sun. As it rises on another hot day in the Egyptian countryside, Shenti, the farmer, wakes up and throws off the rough linen sheet that was woven by his wife. He crawls out of bed to wash, shave, and get dressed. Unlike people today, he doesn't have to think long about what to wear, because it's always the same. A coarse linen kilt and a pair of reed sandals. After a breakfast of bread and fruit, Shenti goes to work and his wife lights the fire and begins grinding the wheat to make bread, the main part of their daily diet. Shenti doesn't have to worry about a long commute because his workplace is minutes away in the fields behind his house. This has been a good year and he's reaped a large harvest. Some of this needs to be given to the temple as payment for use of its land. So he had to give some of this harvest to the temple as payment for his land, which is what we know as taxes. Today is that day. He fills several baskets and loads them into donkey, onto donkeys, then delivers them to the temple with his two field workers. And now it's afternoon. On the way back to work, Shenti and his workers stop for a quick lunch of bread, meat, and beer. They then work all afternoon through the hottest part of the day in the fields. Shenti is working on his crops and tending his few cattle and ducks. He sees the sun slowly go down and after a tiring day makes his way home. And in the evening, he arrives back to find supper's almost ready. Once again, he's eating bread, meat, and beer. There's not much variety to be had. But Shenti isn't used to anything else. And anyway, he's hungry and thirsty, so he's happy enough. As the sun goes down and night sets in, Shenti lights the small oil lamp. He and his wife put their children to bed. It's thousands of years before the discovery of electricity, so there's little to do except go to bed and get some much needed sleep before another day, hard day's work. So now go back and answer the questions about the farmer on your worksheet. Give me a pause the video, go back and answer the questions you can, or you can fill them out as you're listening, but then come back for finally a day in the life of a woman. Just outside Thebes, the sun is rising on a small house near the Nile. Nafrini is already up, with a farmer as a husband plus three small children. She's got a lot to do. 
she starts by preparing breakfast of bread and fruit for her family, who, judging from the noise, are all out of bed now. Like most Egyptian women, she's wearing a rough linen dress and has a reed necklace with an amulet to the pre pregnant goddess Tawaret, believed to help during the danger of childbirth. Although they aren't wealthy, Nefrini and her husband, Sidi, can still afford a servant, Akana, who helps around the house and with the children. Once her husband has left for work, Nefrini leaves the kids with Akana and goes to market. She needs to stock up the store cupboard, basics like lentils, chickpeas, which are both types of beans, lettuce, onion, and garlic. She might buy meat for a special occasion, but it's much too expensive to eat every day. When she gets back, she sprinkles water and natron cleansing salts to keep insects away. She puts down charcoal and powdered bebet plant to kill the fleas. Today is laundry day, so Nafrini gathers up the bed linen and the children for a trip to the river. She quite likes this job. The day isn't too hot yet, and she gets the latest news and gossip from her friends, always keeping one eye on the kids. She normally puts the laundry in the river and pounds it against a large stone. This is long before detergent or soap, but today all the best stones have been taken, so she has to tread the laundry against pebbles in the shallows. When everything is clean, she lays it out to dry in the sun. She, while she waits, she tells, tells the children to look for some reeds, straw, and dry dung to fuel the fire. When the washing is dry, she fills her large water pot and they all go home. So dried dung is, dung is dried poop, which it burns really well, and it blow, burns for a long time, and it burns really hot. Uh, if you remember from last year, we talked about the Native Plains Indians used buffalo chips, which is dried buffalo poop, to light their fires. And it was the kids' job to go collect that, too. So now it's afternoon. After putting away the laundry... She sits down with Akana and the children for a light lunch of bread and lettuce. The children are arguing and pulling each other's hair, so she tells them to go out and look for wild honey, which she uses to sweeten food. Sugar won't be discovered for thousands of years yet. With the house now quiet, Nefrini can get on with some cooking. She lights the conical mud fire and starts grinding emmet wheat to make flour for the bread. She adds water to make dough which she rounds off into flat, flat loaves and then puts in the oven. While the bread is baking, she starts on the beer. From the oven, she takes partly baked barley dough and crumbles it into a large vat. She adds some water and date juice and leaves it to ferment. Now it's evening. The bread is baked, the children have brought back some honey, and Sebi will be home soon. So Nefrini starts on dinner. Today, the Tut and What's It family Ha, is having stew of lentils, chickpeas, and onion. Nefrini knows Sebi will be happy because the night before he had been grumbling about eating nothing but bread. Everything is put in a clay pot and goes into the oven. Sebi arrives home and the family sits down to eat. By the time they finished, it's six o'clock and the sun has almost set. With no electricity, their day follows the rise and fall of the sun. They all go to bed and are soon fast asleep. So now you're going to make sure that you had both pages completely filled out, answering the questions using the reading. If you need to go back, you know, listen to more of the reading or go back and reread it, um, you can do that and fill these in. Once you have all the questions filled out, you'll click close and click turn it in. If you have any questions, send me a chat on Teams, send me a chat on Remind, or send me an email.